You're listening to the Minutes on Growth podcast, the show that brings you mindfully curated insights into relationships, spirituality, personal development, and everything in between with your host, Tanaz Hussainpour. Hi, soul friends, it's Tanaz Hussainpour, and welcome back to another short solo episode of Minutes on Growth. I want to briefly talk about the importance of putting in the work in relationships. Last week, I was in a session with a couple that I've recently started working with, and at the end of the session, after sharing multiple relational tools with them, the young man looked at me and said, why did we not learn these in school? And why did we not pick up on these insights as we grew up and as we went through different relationships? Why is this knowledge not available to us through experience? And it got me thinking Wow, the work that we consciously do in our relationships, we need to seek this knowledge. Not all of it comes to us on its own. This is knowledge that is as a result of years and years and years of research by psychologists and um, relational coaches. Most of these relational tools and skills is something we have to set an intention to learn and to acquire, and it requires effort. So is it worth it? Is it worth it to read all these books, to go to all these seminars and listen to the podcasts and enroll in the courses and go to coaching and go to therapy? Because not only is it a lot of effort, but we're putting in a lot of time, money, and energy into it. In my opinion, it is worth it. Not only as someone who has coached hundreds of couples, but also looking at it through the lens of my own experience going to couples therapy and coaching. Reflecting back on my relationships when I was 16 and 17, even up until the age of 24, the quality of my relationships honestly are incomparable to the relationships I have now. Back then, drama was a constant in my relationships. Fighting and the silent treatment, oh, they were on the menu every month. Back then, I didn't know how to communicate my feelings in a way where the other person wouldn't get defensive. I didn't know how to gather my thoughts and really relay them in a constructive way. Back then, I didn't even know what boundaries were, so I was stuck in this really unhealthy loop of people-pleasing burnout. Back then, I didn't know how to show love in a way that the other person could feel it and resonate with it. And I'm not only talking about my intimate relationships, but my relationships with my family members and my friends and my coworkers. The tools that I've learned over the years and the skills that I've acquired and enhanced have really changed the quality of my life. And it keeps getting better. Because learning is one thing, but implementing it is a whole different story. So am I implementing the communication skills better today than a year ago? Definitely. The more practice you have, the better you become at it. And the quality of our life is truly, truly impacted by the quality of our relationships. When we're able to live in a peaceful home, when we're able to create a fulfilling environment for ourselves at work, when we're able to create deep and meaningful bonds with our friends and loved ones, our mood changes. More importantly, when we're able to process heavy emotions and have uncomfortable, difficult conversations in a respectful manner, it's a game changer. The quality of our life significantly increases. So is it worth it? Yes. But is it a lot of work? The answer is also yes. I want us to briefly pause and for a second, recognize why this work is so important right now, in this moment of time. What we need to take into consideration is, if all of this is learned, and most of it is learned, and we are now living in a world with tremendous advancements in technology that have allowed us to learn in an instant, whether it's online on Google or all the amazing content creators on Instagram, then we have what our parents didn't have. Our parents didn't have access, the keyword is access, to these resources, to the scope that we do. 
you know, they either had to go to school and study psychology or they had to be, you know, avid learners where they had to try so much harder to gain access to their local libraries. And the amount of material out there was much more limited. So what we need to realize is, okay, as the millennials, we need to do the work. We are now at that age where we're now building families and we're, you know, creating the next generation. So it's a time sensitive matter. And we have access to so much information. So it's not the access to information that was the issue with our parents, but rather the implementation part of it, putting in the hours and work and effort to practice what we're learning to practice all this information that we're acquiring. So this is definitely the time. We are the generation that can change the narrative. We are the generation that can create fulfilling, healthy love stories. Not the ones we grew up watching on Disney, but real love stories. The question is, will we do it? Will we allow ourselves the opportunity to rewire our nervous system? Will we allow ourselves the opportunity to reprogram the way we look at and think about relationships and communication and connection? For decades, we heard the advice, don't go to bed angry, which puts so much pressure on couples to resolve matters immediately, which could potentially lead to one party abandoning their truth for the sake of peace at bedtime which then built resentment over time. But now we know that it's okay. It's okay to go to bed angry. It's okay to pause to allow the nervous system to regulate, to soothe. Not everything needs to be solved right then, especially if one of the parties is experiencing a freeze response. It's okay to pause and come back to the discussion when both parties are calmer and can, and can communicate in a respectful manner. Speaking of respect, now thanks to psychologists such as Dr. John Gottman from the Gottman Institute, we now know about the four horsemen, criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and contempt, and how their presence in our relationship and our communication can lead to conflict. For more on the four horsemen, please listen to the episode named Healthy Relationships with Elizabeth Earnshaw on this podcast. In fact, Dr. John Gottman's research, and this is a crazy statistic, shows us that if contempt is present in a marriage, there's a 93% chance the relationship will end in divorce. 93%. So the moment we know what contempt is, how it shows up, and what the antidote is, we can stop ourselves from engaging in it. So we do have control over the 50% that we bring into the relationship. When we know better, we can do better. And when we do better, the chances of it getting better increases. Now we know that people process love differently, thanks to Dr. Gary Chapman, whose research showed us that people's primary love languages can look different and that sometimes Couples feel like their efforts aren't being recognized by the other person because they're speaking to their partner in their own love language instead of their partner's love language. Once we have awareness of all of these relational tools and more, we can become proactive with the quality of our relationship. We can break generational patterns. We can write a new story, one where we are in a loving, healthy relationship that brings joy to every cell of our body. Remember, healthy, loving relationships aren't manifested. They are created. And like everything else in life, if you truly want it and put in the work, you can experience it. Just a side note that a healthy relationship does not mean that there's no conflict. It just means that we know how to communicate and navigate and process that conflict in a way where both parties Leave the conversation feeling heard, seen, and valued. Sending you lots of love. Speak soon. Thank you for joining us this week on Minutes on Growth. If you enjoyed today's episode, then make sure you never miss a show 
by clicking the subscribe button now.